for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Waiting to be profiled are Olan Jones and author Hart Getson. Actor, composer, director, Olan Jones was born actually in Los Angeles but was raised by a free-spirited mother in the ghettos across the United States, London, and the jungles of the Yucatan. She started acting at the age of 16 at off-off Broadway theaters, married playwright Sam Shepard when she was a mere 19, <laughs> raised a son <laughs> while originating roles um, as the woman in um, Beth Henley's, Murray Mednick's, John Stepling's, and a bunch of other authors, uh, writers. And she's quite the cultural icon. We're happy to have her with her, because aside from that part of her life that we were talking about, she has written original musicals, right? Yeah. Three operas. She's written scores for things. Um, the opera that I saw was um, The Woman in the wall. So how did this musical background come? Well, you were in the jungles of the Yucatan. Yeah. <laughs> a little creature hopped by. <laughs> With uh, a harp. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I guess my musical background just came from listening. And uh, oh. I've got one of those math brains where I can oh, wow. tell the principle of what's going on. And so, yeah, my background is, is wild as the jungle and I don't have any uh, official. I've depended on the kindness of my musical directors if I have not put the right markings. But I know how to read music and write you music. You can read music. Did you take music lessons? No, it was, it was in my family. My grandmother was something of a prodigy. She could hear mu a tune and then pick it out on the piano when she was two. So there was always a, a piano around and it, uh, it seemed obvious to me the principles for how music is written and how you read it. So it I think it was just sort of hardwired in. When you were acting, did you did you do musicals? I well, I started out as a singer songwriter. Oh, yeah. And then you know, of course, when I was in the jungles, that's when I was. <laughs> <laughs> Are we really talking about the jungles? Is this we're really talking true? about? Yeah, we're talking <coughs> about living in a a small town of eighty Mayan Indians. Oh wow. Spanish was their <gasps> second language too. Oh. I was in. Uh, did you live in a hut? Language? No, oh. I didn't. It was we were sort of insular, but. We did live in a hut, and there was a, a cook hut in the back, which meant a small hut with a slab, but it was sort of hollowed out, and you built a fire and scorpions. You did? It, yeah. Did, was there a drum in there, too? I <laughs> 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 keep seeing you, like hitting a drum. Because you did use that beat in the opera that I saw. Well, it, that was more medieval mode. Yes, but it, there was that There's, kind of uh, beat yeah. to it. There's always a drum. I cannot, I cannot write something without a you, drum. You um, have written three other operas. Yeah. And, and what were they? Just give those to us quickly. Uh, one was called The Woman Who Forgot Her Sweater. We did that at the, <laughs> at the Ford, inside the Ford, and that, had, that was lots of jungle, real jungle stuff. I like that. It had the civilized music, and then it had What Lurks Underneath. And then we also did one called Heracles and the Hydra, which was an evening of four different operas. And you wrote all, you wrote the I've music or you wrote the, the words? I've written the music to the music. librettos. I, I write the story with the librettos. Uh, and then? And then uh, once we've got the story, she writes the words, or whoever I'm working with writes the words, and then I write the music. And, and the last, thir the third one? Well, this this big one was the... Oh, this was the one we're yeah. talking about, which is the medieval, right. Right, and that's a full-length one, and it's it's uh, it's written for that big choir, you know, there's... Let's talk about that, because yeah. um, y you had a sound designer, original music, s 
songs uh, for the theater. What's a sound design? Sound design is sometimes it's just like effects, but it's also like transitions or sometimes a lot of it is composing little songs. Like when I worked with the LA Women's Shakespeare Company, it was to have little songs they could dance to or songs they could sing. In between? Or yeah, or, or during, like if Shakespeare's songs put to music and however I put it to music and orchestrated however I, I did. Uh, you, you also wrote some other musicals. Were right. they, they weren't operas. They weren't operas. They were, but you know, there's that, that <laughs> ghastly moment where people break into song. <laughs> in yeah, oh yeah. Musical. I love that. <laughs> Those like, are like oh. movies, right? <laughs> yeah. And then they start singing. Here it comes, yeah. So I've just done so much experimentation with different kinds of music and words, and I, I really love the, the poetry that's available and that you can use freely in operas. Well, you did do that. So how did Woman in the Wall originate? Well, I was driving down the road, yes. and I heard on the radio <laughs> somebody talking about this practice that they really had in the medieval times, which nuns <gasps> would sign up for the honor of being immured, which means walled into a room their entire lives. Oh, that's interesting. And they would have one window on the church and one window on the outside world, and it just gave me the chills because I thought, is this not a metaphor for our own lives? Here but we are. <laughs> I know, but that's so great because you you did this in a room where there was no sets, and the way you did it, you brought that window and opened oh, yeah. it, and she looked out. It was really, uh, it was very effective. Well, I'm glad because when I was doing it, the thing that became clear <coughs> to me is, first, you know how you go on intuition, and then after the fact, you can describe, oh, that's why the intuition was right. right. But the intuition was to make all of the, externals pretend, very, very pretend, like the pretend walls and the pretend window uh, uh, and the pretend flats. You know, we could have brought out a basket of apples, but to have the flat for That was so great, just painted and yeah. put there, yeah. And, and a I, basket painted and Yeah, put yeah. And I realized afterwards that it was to do with underlining the fact that everything interior to this woman was real and everything interior oh. to all of the people, that was the true part and the exterior it was all for pretend and could show up in any kind of yeah. form. But that was pretty subtle. Yeah. You know, to get to, to think about her insides and right. then think about what was going on outside. You got this idea while you were listening to the radio. How did Kathleen Kathleen, Kathleen Kramer well, come in? She and I had written a lot of we've written some musicals together and we'd written that the the woman who forgot <laughs> her sweater together. And, oh. <laughs> and I love her writing and I thought I called her up. I said, "Isn't this doesn't this sound like an idea that we are interested in?" Yeah. <laughs> because it's it it you can tell you know when there's a potent seed to something that it can right. turn into something. And so I didn't hear from her for a couple of months. And I called her back to say, "Well, what did you think?" And she had already gone to the library. It had stacks oh, of books on it. And, How great! And she studied you know Thomas Aquinas's virtues because you know how the virtues that's how show it up. Looked. The virtues were great. Yeah. Did you write together? Do you write we together? Wrote, we wrote the story together and the form and the structure, and we talk about the content of it. But then, it's it's better when she gets a flight of fancy. She just gets oh, to. She goes. What yeah. about the music? Then you write the music after or before? A couple of times I wrote it before, just to some themes. But I like writing from the words. Oh, I like so you want the w story I like to then. have the words and the and the uh, the rhythms of the words. Well, you had this huge choral group. Yeah. I mean, it was pretty big. Yeah. There were like twenty six. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty big, and you had an orchestra. Yeah. Because we're in this Masonic temple, right? <laughs> and it's just like one big room, and it was fantastic the way it yeah. was done. It was so original, but. And the conductor, David O, yeah, he's just fantastic. working away. Yeah. Ha have you worked with him before? Yeah, we've worked quite a bit. We did together <laughs> another Overtone Industries production uh, called Songs and Dances of Imaginary Lands. And that had that took seven years to put together. That had oh, 21 so years. Yeah, 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 and he's a good composer, too. So he, was, he composed some things, and oh, he's yeah. done a lot of musical because directing. Because he worked the whole time. I oh, know I you know. directed the play, but he worked the whole time. During it, yeah. And the chorus was up and down. Yeah. How long did it take you to write? <laughs> well, it took... Or to get it actually into production, let's well, say I, that. Well, I wrote... No, it's, it's interesting, because I wrote the, the first half of it 
it took like six years, not every day, but you know, it took six years. And then the second half took six months. Oh, so it really came fast. Yeah, once I, once I, well, you know, there's that secret called consistency, which I've just discovered. You just started following this. Do <laughs> Where you do thing. it every day. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the, how'd you cast it? How'd you find the, those people? Did you write it for, what was her name? Gretchen. Gretchen, Gretchen Johnson. Yeah, Gretchen she's Johnson, been in. The Soprano. Yeah, she's a mezzo, The woman. Actually. She's a mezzo, yes. Yeah, but she actually, deep. she was, had a range in that from, because I knew she could even though it aggravated her in some areas. <laughs> but she has this huge range from like a tenor up to a soprano, but her, she feels that she is a mezzo. So. But anyway, how did you, did you write it for her? Or how'd you yeah, definitely with her voice in mind, because she's, she's also got extraordinary acting ability. You don't usually, I haven't seen uh, opera singers who are like athletes yeah. with such flexibility, such fluidity and such depth of, of acting. So yes, she was always, in my mind, also she understands it's it's like an epic version of an inner journey. It's it's this funny little. I think thing this like is that. funny talking about your inner jer journey because <laughs> um, I know you you worked in Edward Scissorhands, and I thought right. that was an inward journey too <laughs> on your part. Tell us what well, you did on that. <laughs> well, first of all, I had a lot of fun just acting, <laughs> but then um, an interesting musical anecdote is that they there was a huge organ in the in the room where there was supposed to be my house and Tim so you played who did you play this Esmeralda, oh, Esmeralda. I was like so I was sort of like the witch figure in yeah. the neighborhood and uh, Tim Burton said do you know how to play the organ because you know, it's here it is <laughs> it's like you know you bring a gun right. on stage after you and so I said well you know to a certain extent and then he gave me this hymn to play while I was acting and I'm not, even though I can write music for real musicians to play, I'm not a keyboard player. And so... But I a keyboard and an organ is totally well, different. Yeah, like moving this your one had, and Yeah, it had the, the pedal. Pushing and pulling. <laughs> Did you like that? Well, yeah, but I couldn't play what they'd given me. Uh -huh. So I had, to, I had to write something that I could play and also act at the same time. Because I, I maybe could have made it, but it would it, there would have been no room for acting, and I was there for being actor. So. I see, I see, I see. So <laughs> you wrote your own music? Yes, yes, I did. And he liked it? Yeah, yeah, he kept it in. <laughs> That's fantastic. Yeah. Um, just before we leave, tell us a little bit about Vibrant Productions Management well, and then the Overtone right. Industries. Do they work together? Well, we do now, yes. Overtone Industries is the company I started many moons ago, and I got serious with about ten years ago when I realized I'm in this for the duration uh -huh. and I need to have a support system for what I'm creating and Vibrant came on when we did the Songs and Dances of Imaginary Lands. Oh they started with you a long yeah, time ago. Yeah, a couple then. of years ago uh -huh. and they um, they had the idea to make this community arts workshop each weekend oh, which was fantastic. That's great. People would show up and you know they were crocheting stuff out of plastic. And, and did you work with them too? Was I did. Mostly it was your... Snezhna Petrovic who was the the production designer for I that see. piece. But yeah a lot of the, so things textures for different things were in the production and Oh, in your production of Woman in the Wall? No, the, in, oh, in, our, in, in the, the Songs and songs. Dances of Imaginary Land. But they did produce they produced that, and then they produced uh, Woman in the Wall. And it's, yeah, it's a fantastic partnership. They're, they just are so excellent in every area. And how do you find those site-specific places? Because who knew that there was a big room like that or that the Masonic Temple would let us it in? Out? Yeah. yeah, well, I went there to see some other music, some folk music, and then it just had such a ceremonial atmosphere, mm -hmm. and it's hard to go back into a theater once uh, once you've been in an oh, environment. Really? Yeah. Really? Oh, that's fantastic. I did a concert reading in a theater of the Woman in the Wall, and it just felt constricted and Oh, that's spot. really good. Yeah. Well, then we should all try to go to those kind of places, or find them, I yeah. think. Just yes. look for them, and they're there. Olan, Olan, <laughs> I love it. Thank you for being with us today. Thank you for having me. It was fun. And Don't Go Away will be right back with author Hart Getson. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guest, author Hart Getson, 
is a Southern gentleman, born in Texas, raised in North Carolina and Virginia, earned a Bachelor of Arts in Art History at Vassar, and studied in London at the International Film School. He's produced and directed film and video games, and he's had a career as a painter. <laughs> Hart, you used the word immerse, immerse, immerse. As I was reading everything that you had written and your bio, that word kept jumping out, and there were so many things. Uh, for example, color field painting. You immersed, uh, or Barnett Newman immersed himself. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, that is actually the whole aesthetic theme to my whole crazy career. I Immerse. mean, immersion <laughs> and immersive entertainment. And it all started with one of Barnett Newman's paintings, Who's Afraid of Red, <coughs> Yellow, and Blue. Uh -huh. One of that series I saw uh, many years ago at the Met, and it had a profound effect on me. Shortly thereafter, I started painting series of paintings, color field paintings, and then moved um, eventually into motion pictures and into all of the very immersive um, sort of all the way up to IMAX 3D um, large formats. You studied art history with Linda Nochlin? Yes. Who is fantastic. Yep. Um, was that an influence on color field? Did she influence that? Honestly, I think she influenced me more as a writer because really? when I was very um, young, um, growing up in North Carolina, I was very interested in art history. And for some reason, I found one or, f one or two of her books, and it was oh. just incredibly enlightening, and it really struck a chord in me. So I actually... Um, was hoping to find her as a teacher at Vassar College, and I did, and that was oh. a big reason why I went there. I, n I never thought Vassar was co-educational. Of course, it, was. it changed it was. a long time. Yeah, you, you get behind in what's going on. So, were you one of the first after it changed? It changed it about ten <coughs> years before <coughs> I went. Oh, it had. So it was. It was. Fully, you were immersed. It was, yeah. it was already immersed. <laughs> it was. It was <laughs> pretty much fifty-fifty co-ed by the time I got there. So did. Newman do the paintings in the chapel in Houston? Uh, yeah, well, he did the 14 Stations of the Cross. Yes. And um, I, I also had an opportunity to see those at the National Gallery. And I'm not sure where they are now, but I wrote my thesis on that so, series. So immersion in simulation entertainment, that's part of what we're talking What does that mean? That um, was sort of a continuation of uh, putting an audience in front of, from a color field and modulating colors into a motion picture image by wrapping the audience <coughs> around with a screen and putting them on a motion platform and tying it all together into one kind of overwhelming connected experience. Maybe we should talk a little bit about color field, what that means, because a lot of people don't understand color field. It took me a long time to understand it. it looks like you just slap something on a canvas, but it's really not like that. For me, it's a <laughs> very sophisticated communication, and um, especially with Rothko and Newman, um, they were somehow able to uh, juxtapose different colors and convey emotion and an expression. Does it mean just one color on the canvas or can it be any or many colors? I always thought color field was one color on a canvas. I, th I, think, uh, I think primarily it's known as one, um, one color or sort of a range of colors. Like building up. Right. I, I know that all the artists who that I know are color field painters have 50 paint different colors underneath this one gray wall. Right. right. <coughs> so that's what I was wondering so about. So I think what I think um, you have the static images that are very immersive and then you have um, when you get into a serial format uh, the way Barnett Newman and others have worked you this, introduce the element of time. I see the serial when, when I was talking about that I was talking about the Rothko Chapel. In okay. Houston. Okay. Sure. And that has just what you're talking exactly. about too. And exactly. when you sit in the middle of that, you are immersed. Exactly. So you have this all around you. Um, after you talk about wrapping the audience and the entertainment, 
your writing is immersive. I'm just using this word because every time I got to what we were going to talk about, it had immerse in front of it. Novels, uh, websites, games, you use that in, in, how would you say you use that in a website? It's a very different kind of experience, um, what people refer to as transmedia. And what we start with with this project is a series of books and a narrative. And within that narrative, in another version of the book, there will be code inserted and, and all kinds of other information. That's immersive writing? Is that, or the website? Is that well, what we where it talking? becomes immersive in a sort of um, uh, play on that idea is when you have <coughs> books, websites, and then a Do reality all, game, and they all work together. They all work together. I Correct. see, I see, I see. I thought they were all separate. Well, that takes us then to the ultimate game, which is the novel that you wrote. Correct. Um, which we it's, have here. And um, Echo's Revenge, where is it set? Uh, it's set in a little town in the state of Washington, and it starts off, it's a story about two brothers. And they start off in a very um, dysfunctional family uh, environment. And their refuge is in the world of video games and playing these games and mastering these games and having a very extended social life in these games. So it lets them kind of leap out of their world and become bigger players in, in the world outside. OK, so what audience did you write this for? I originally wrote this for um, uh, sort of guys 12 to 15, Okay. Vid very specifically for gamers. Okay. What's a gamer? Just someone who plays video games on a regular basis, who has a regular social circles that they play Cause with. Because you talk about gamer. What? Yeah. And then who is Echo? Echo <laughs> is this creature in the game that they... Um, uh, Destroy basically. I mean, I mean while they're playing, it, yeah, the, yeah, it's either he's going to get them or they're going to get him, and um, they become masters in this game and they're able to to beat him. These two boys. Okay, what is a reality game? A reality game is um, the idea of having a game play in the real world using. Uh, augmented, augmented information from computers, books, television, whatever you know you have to convey information. But isn't that kind of scary? Having this like a game, computer game going on in real life? Is most, that how it happens? Most reality, uh, alternate reality games or augmented reality games are more socially um, oriented. So what I've done is taken that concept and blended it in the book with um, a horror story, basically. Well, yeah, it kind of was like and scary, but yeah. you didn't write it under Hart Getson. You wrote it under Sean... Austin. Austin. Correct. Where'd you get that name? That, that reminded <laughs> me of like video games or people on email who don't want to say their true identity and that it's kind of thing. It's a game tag. It's, it's <laughs> basically a tag. <laughs> right. and. I chose um, that name because I wanted a video game writer to be reporting this investigation and condu conducting this investigation. So that's how I came up with that. Yeah, I wondered about that. And the other thing, so, so we've talked about all the things that I went through, and I, it was kind of hard uh, thinking, uh, can you learn about a computer from reading the book? You can learn, um, basically what you can learn from this book is kind of what happens when people are brought out from the virtual world into the real world and how they interact. Um. And the second book is all about how the game was made and how it went wrong. And it's all about the designers. It's kind of pulling the curtain back and letting you see so what the process is like. A, and the third, there's a third the book? The third too? book is, uh, follows this, and it's more in the line of the thriller action of this book. When, um, I'm back to, to the contents of this book, because talk about Hacker and Claw and Seven. I mean, you have to keep all these things straight, right? There are a variety of characters because we have the gamers on one hand, we have the... Are the gamers the boys? The gamers are the boys okay. in their whole world, okay. and then you have the designers on the other side of that world. 
And within the uh, designer side, you have all kinds of personalities, which you learn about in the second book. And one is this guy, Hacker, right. who has decided to play his own games oh, within, within the game. I got it. Okay. And so he sabotages these poor guys once in a while and kind of confuses them. I see. And the, and the last one is, what's a zombie processor? <laughs> Zombie processors are computers like possibly your own PC, which you're not, if you're not aware, or if you don't have the right kind of firewall or whatever protection, that people use your computer to do other things oh, the just for processing That's time. why I wondered if you could learn a lot about yes. computers from just reading this Absolutely. book. Absolutely. Um, you actually think about... Um, STEM, STEM, which I think is fantastic. Science, technology, um, engineering, engineering and, math. and math. How did that come into this? Because I think that's what we want all of our youth to, to concentrate on, and they're not getting enough of it. It came in, um, after I wrote the book, I realized one of the um, sort of devices I used was making everything very realistic and based on real science. Uh. And when I got done with the book, I realized, wait, mm -hmm. there's a great opportunity here to have all kinds of links to real STEM opportunities and educational opportunities. And so that part of it took off on the website. I have a lot of that on the website. That, and do, are people thinking about it and, and trying to use it in school? A lot of, um, there's a lot important. of excitement about the book because of that, yes. And it's already been put on summer reading lists ah. and um, um, a lot of uh, sort of science programs are starting to pick up on it and do it. And, yeah, because yeah. I think that that science part of it is really important. And I know um, I go to the UN and go to meetings at the UN all the time. And many of those NGO groups are trying to promote this STEM, this STEM situ thing. So yeah. it's great that, that it's a part of this. It's a very big part of it. And in fact, all of the most frightening elements um, of the book are composed of real technology. And well, the next military. book, since you're such a great artist, or you're an artist, <laughs> I want to see some paintings in the book <laughs> done by you. I'm wor doing something <laughs> like that in the website. Good. Yes. That's what I like. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much. And keep writing to us at 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles, 90017. But J-A-Q-U-I-N-N-1 at AOL.com. See you next time.